destroys your liver, one of the worst things you can eat. I don't know, alcohol? Herbal supplements? Seed oils. Of course. So I'm actually not going to be talking about this weird video. There's a different weird video I want to focus on instead. But first, what are seed oils? As you might have guessed, they are oils from the seeds of plants. Corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, peanut oil, soybean oil, canola oil are common examples. Most of these oils are cheap, they have a neutral flavor, and they also have a high smoke point. So unsurprisingly, they're often used commercially, right? In restaurants, packaged foods, processed foods, you name it. This is the ugly truth about vegetable oils. That's a clip from TikToker Orim and her video, The Truth About Vegetable Oils. She is vegan, actually, going by her What I Ate Todays. She has a bunch of those, so maybe I'll check those out another time. Now, it may seem like I am intentionally choosing this video, right? Some kind of random TikTok from a very young person. Why not analyze anti-seed oil arguments from actual doctors like Paul Saladino and Eric Berg? Pretty sure Saladino has a doctorate in psychiatry and Berg is a chiropractor, but close enough. The truth is I'm choosing this video because it's a good representation of the movement. She's got all the claims, all the arguments, all the conspiracies. Oh yeah, she's really done her research. And again, she's vegan, right? You Usually it's the meat boys going after the seed oils, not the like pretty tofu girls. <laughs> Just to clarify before we get into the video, she says vegetable oils, but she is specifically talking about seed oils. That becomes clear towards the end when she talks about how healthy olive oil is. Let's talk about the healthier alternatives. Organic, cold pressed, extra virgin olive oil. Olive oil is a vegetable oil, even though olives are not a vegetable. It doesn't matter. It's all stupid. <laughs> Once upon a time, vegetable oils were developed to lubricate machinery and fuel lamps. You know what else can be used to lubricate machinery and fuel lamps? Yeah, olive oil. Just because a food has non-culinary uses or even was developed for non-culinary uses doesn't mean it's unhealthy. Just because a food isn't natural doesn't mean it's unhealthy. She then starts talking about Crisco, which was originally made with cottonseed oil. It was developed by brother-in-laws William Proctor and James Gamble, Proctor and Gamble, and they first started using cottonseed oil as a cheaper alternative to animal fat for candlesticks and soap. Those were their businesses that they combined. But then electricity happened, and so the demand for candles declined, and they needed another use for cottonseed cottonseed oil. Through patented technology, the brothers were able to hydrogenate cottonseed oil and develop a substance that closely resembled lard, aka Crisco. They advertised Crisco as a more affordable and better tasting option to cook and bake with. Very quickly, America fell in love with Crisco. This is true, and if you Google Crisco ads, you will find just the craziest marketing. Afraid you serve your family fried foods too often? You can relax. Crisco fried foods are so digestible, you can eat them seven days a week. Hindsight's 2020. We now know digestibility is not good enough to declare a food safe for consumption. And in fact, Crisco in its original form, how it was when it was being marketed like this, is one of the last things you'd want to eat on a daily basis. It was full of trans fat, which is the worst fat for heart health. It's so bad that it is now considered unsafe in the U.S. It's not safe to eat. The FDA banned partially hydrogenated fats, which is the main source of artificial trans fats back in 2015. So while I don't think anyone today would really consider like current Crisco to be a health food, it's certainly healthier than it used to be. The American Heart Association was founded in 1924. You know, the people who are dedicated to fighting heart disease, those guys. They were a very small, unpopular group until 1948 when they received their first big fund, a massive donation of 20 million in today's dollars from yours truly, Procter and Gamble, the makers of Crisco. This generous donation literally transformed this small group into a well-known national health organization organization. Throughout the 1940s and 50s, heart disease continued to rise and rise. So in 1961, the American Heart Association decided to put out a public recommendation to prevent heart disease. They recommended that men and women decrease their intake of saturated fat 
animal fats and to increase intake of polyunsaturated vegetable oils. And they said that this is the most promising protection against heart disease. They had no scientific evidence to back up this claim, but they did have a fat paycheck. A lot going on here. Let's start with the conspiracy that the American Heart Association started recommending vegetable oils in place of animal fats in 1961 because of a fat paycheck from Procter & Gamble in 1948. We're supposed to believe that a donation made more than 70 years ago has completely influenced this huge nonprofit that has received donations from numerous other corporations, including from the animal agriculture industry, aka saturated fat. The American Egg Board is one of their top donors for their second century campaign, and yet AHA still recommends limiting saturated fat. In fact, the American Heart Association's guidelines really haven't changed that much since 1961. The limit on overall fat intake was dropped in 2015, but they still say limit saturated fat and replace it with polyunsaturated fat. The biggest change came in 2000 with the recommendation to limit trans fat, which again, Crisco, full of trans fat. So like clearly the AHA is not really influenced by Procter & Gamble or big Crisco, big seed or big shortening big shortening. And it doesn't seem like they ever were. If we actually read their 1961 position, where they initially recommend polyfats, we see in Appendix 2 that margarines and shortenings are not a great source of polyunsaturated fats. They even thought that including the fatty acid composition on the label would be a good idea. In other words, they wanted Americans to be able to see that, oh, Crisco is not a good source of polyunsaturated fats. I don't want this to seem like I'm in favor of huge food conglomerates, funding, health organizations, nutrition, nonprofits. I'm not. But we can always look to the history of the organization, their recommendations, how their recommendations have changed. Do they align with the evidence? For the AHA, it really does not seem like their guidelines have been heavily influenced by Procter & Gamble. And if you really want to talk about the influence of Procter & Gamble and seed oils and whatever, then you also need to talk about the possible influence of, again, the animal agriculture culture industry, but whatever. Oh, this little snippet from who knows where it claims that the AHA resisted giving advice on heart disease prevention throughout the 50s due to a lack of evidence, except according to the AHA's own recommendations timeline, this is not true. In 1957, they recommended limiting total fat intake, and they said the possibility remains that the kind rather than the amount of fat in the diet is responsible for atherosclerosis. Obviously, they were already leaning towards limiting certain kinds of fats. You can't blame Ansel Keys for everything. Now I ought to show you how vegetable oil is made because it's pretty fucking nasty. Again, she's not talking about vegetable oils like olive and avocado. She's talking about highly refined seed oils, specifically canola oil. Ooh, look at this. Machinery. Gross. Oh, again, just because something looks gross and unnatural doesn't mean it's unhealthy. 70 minute wash with a solvent. This chemical extraction process removes all but a trace of oil. They wash the oil for 20 minutes with sodium hydroxide. After washing and filtering the oil, they bleach it to lighten the color. Then use a steam injection heating process to remove the canola odor. The oil is now fully refined and ready for bottling. To me, this is really the only possibly credible argument against seed oil consumption. The refining process does remove vitamins. Now, look, even a cold pressed olive oil is still mostly fat. It's oil, right? It's got some antioxidants. It's got some vitamin, vitamin E, right? Which is an antioxidant, vitamin K, but it's mostly fat. More important than what refining strips away is what it adds, what it creates. Trans fatty acids, glycidol, which is a possible carcinogen. That doesn't mean canola or sunflower oil is giving us cancer. There's no evidence for that. Generally, the evidence on seed oils is pretty good, particularly for canola. So it's a very mild concern. The only reason I think these compounds could be concerning is if you are consuming lots of seed oils, which probably means you're eating out a lot, consuming a lot of restaurant food, a lot of processed foods. Through this processing, any good fat that was in these oils has been destroyed and transformed into bad fat. These oils contain extremely high amounts of omega-6 fat, yet no omega-3 fat. No omega-3 fats, and yet her own chart shows omega-3 fats in soybean, canola, walnut, and flax. 
works. And what is this anyway? Where did she find this? Corn oil doesn't contain any omega-3, 0%? That is not true. It doesn't have a lot, but it has some. And fish is 100%. No, nothing is 100% of a single fat. What does fish mean? Like different fish have different fatty acid compositions. Even a high omega-3 fish like salmon is not 100% omega-3. It definitely contains omega-6 as well as monounsaturated fat, saturated fat, and even a tiny bit of trans fat. Now you may be wondering, why are we talking about omega-6s? What What's wrong with them? Consuming too much omega-6 without being balanced by omega-3s causes inflammation in the body. The average American is eating these vegetable oils multiple times a day, always experiencing inflammation. And a chronically inflamed body is an unhealthy body, very susceptible to health issues. This is the main argument against seed oils inflammation. The body can convert omega-6 fatty acids, specifically linoleic acid, the most common one, into arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid, it's said, is inflammatory. And because seed oils contain moderate to high amounts of omega-6, they are inherently inflammatory. This is not even close to the whole story. For one thing, our bodies convert only a tiny amount of the linoleic acid we consume into arachidonic acid. This 2011 systematic review of nine trials found essentially no association between linoleic acid consumption and arachidonic acid levels. Increasing linoleic acid by as much as 551% from baseline and reducing it by as much as 90% from baseline failed to yield compelling evidence. Second, and even if linoleic acid did increase arachidonic acid levels, this wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing because arachidonic acid can be anti-inflammatory too. It's kind of like phytic acid, right? Carnivore and keto types really hate phytic acid because it can interfere with nutrient absorption, but it might be good for us too. But maybe there's some other way linoleic acid can be inflammatory. If only we had some evidence, maybe some randomized controlled trials looking at linoleic acid consumption and inflammation markers. Ooh, maybe even a systematic review of those trials. We conclude that virtually no evidence is available from randomized controlled intervention studies among healthy non-infant human beings to show that addition of linoleic acid to the diet increases the concentration of inflammatory markers. Not only is linoleic acid not associated with an increase in inflammation, it's associated with a decrease. This epidemiological study on 1,287 men found those consuming the most linoleic acid had the least inflammation. And there are numerous other studies with similar conclusions. Linoleic acid appears to be anti-inflammatory. Again, inflammation is the crux of the anti-seed oil movement argument, and it is so easily debunked, has been so easily debunked for like a decade. Why is this still around? Before vegetable oils were put in everything, humans naturally ate a ratio of about 1 to 1 or 2 to 1 of omega-6s to omega-3s. That's a good, healthy ratio. The truth is, while we know omega-3s are good for us and that Americans don't eat a lot of them, we don't really know what the ideal ratio is. You can't just say our ancestors ate one to one, so that's that's the best. And her argument that we should reduce omega-6s to improve the ratio, no, that is not what experts recommend. Instead of cutting back on omega-6, we should incorporate more omega-3s. Somehow I forgot to mention the infamous trans fat. Now trans fat is interesting because they could not hide from the public just how terrible it was for humans. Who is they? The American Heart Association? Again, they started recommending against it in 2000. Now, the evidence for it being bad for us became really overwhelming sometime in the 90s. It sounds about right. I know we want policies and guidelines to shift instantly, but that's just not how it works. It takes some time. There's no evidence that like they knew trans fats were bad and they were just hiding it from me <laughs> because of a donation in 1948. <laughs> There's a little loophole in the food industry. Basically, if a serving of a product contains 0.5 grams or less of trans fat, they are allowed to round that number down to zero on the label. Yes, 0.5 grams is a small amount, but most processed foods are not designed for us to just eat one serving. For some brands, one serving is like 12 chips. Who the fuck is gonna eat just 12 chips? If we're indulging, we may eat five servings. And at five servings, that is 2.5 grams of artery clogging trans fat that you thought was zero. Just to be clear, five servings would be less than 2.5 grams. Again, the rule is less than 0.5 
per serving. But she is right. I mean, if, if you eat lots of Crisco and other products with tiny amounts of trans fat, right, you've got 0.3 grams here, 0.2 grams there, it adds up. The World Health Organization says less than 2.2 grams per day, and you could definitely exceed that, again, eating lots of processed food. But at that point, I mean, seed oils aren't really the issue, right? Even that amount of trans fat probably isn't so much the issue. It's the processed food, right? It's the fact that you are eating lots of calories, very little nutrients every single day, whether there's trans fat or not, it's not good for you. Oh, fun fact, animal products do contain tiny amounts of trans fat. I guess I said that earlier with fish. Now, we don't know if naturally occurring trans fat has the same, you know, harmful effects as artificial trans fat, but uh, yeah, thought I'd mention it. Here is a popular margarine today, basil. It's basically just vegetable oils, salt, and preservatives. Now here's one of their margarine varieties, made with olive oil. Wow, that's the good oil we were just talking about. It must be healthy then. Well, if we take a look at the back, we can see that actually 74% of it is vegetable oils, and only six fucking percent is olive oil. That deserves an A plus on the false advertising. While I agree, this is false advertising, 6%, that's, that's pretty bullshit. Her highlighting palm oil is really weird. Palm oil is a vegetable oil, yes, but its composition is far different from most other vegetable oils. Like coconut oil, it's mostly saturated fat, very little polyunsaturated fat. You think she would like palm oil. Another healthy alternative is coconut oil. Clearly she believes saturated fat is fine. I do not. I don't believe it's fine because the bulk of the evidence does not say it's fine. The recommendations in most countries is to limit saturated fat, which typically means animal products. Now the AHA, I believe, did come out against coconut oil a few years back. The saturated fat in coconut oil is a little bit different, so maybe it's a little bit better. But even if you doubt the evidence linking saturated fat consumption to cardiovascular disease and you think saturated fat is just neutral, that doesn't mean it's a health food. If you care about health, which clearly she does, then you should be incorporating lots of polyunsaturated fats, the fats that are actually associated with better health. If you eat a lot of processed food though, and you eat out a lot, it is going to be challenging. It's gonna require a lot more home-cooked meals, but if you want to improve your health and vitality, it is worth it. Which I think virtually everyone can get behind, right? Like who thinks eating a bunch of restaurant food, a bunch of processed foods is good for us? No one. And if you are limiting those foods, then you very likely are limiting seed oils because we tend not to cook with those at home. The only one I regularly use is canola oil. I like that it has omega-3s. It's good for baking because it has virtually no flavor. I put it in my hummus because again, no flavor. I don't like the olive oil taste in hummus. For like sauteing and whatnot, for just cooking at home, I use olive oil. But even if you do cook with mostly, I don't know, sunflower, safflower oil, whatever, okay, there's no evidence that's harmful. What matters is the overall dietary pattern. Are you eating fruits and vegetables? Are you getting enough fiber? Are you getting enough water? Are you maintaining a healthy weight? Or are half your calories coming from corn oil? Yeah, not good. Or half your calories coming from coconut oil? Also not good, probably worse. As a health nut, cutting out vegetable oils is my biggest recommendation for people who want to improve their health. We want so badly for there to be that one food that's making us fat and sick. How nice, how nice that would be, right? If it were just seed oils and we just get rid of those and that's it, we're done we're healthy. It's the pattern that matters and often it's the calories. If you eat too many calories from seed oils or animal oils, it's not good for you. You're probably going to gain weight and obesity is bad. I mean, that's really the biggest problem with any oil, right? Is that a tablespoon of oil is over 100 calories in this teeny tiny package. Compare that to 100 calories of strawberries. This is like several cups of strawberries. If you're adding a bunch of oils to your foods, any oils and getting too many calories, calories, it's not great. So that's my video. I do want to say, uh, I don't need to say this to my audience, I don't think, but just in case, like, be nice to her. I don't, I don't know her actual name, but um, she's very young. She's just all excited about something she learned about and she's just very wrong, but she doesn't know that and she thinks she's helping people, you know, like, who am I, who am I to criticize, especially of all people? I recommended a fucking fruit diet. It's the Paul Saladinos and the Eric Bergs. They're the ones I have less sympathy for, right? They are making money off of this. They should know better. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do like and subscribe 
subscribe and thank you so much to my members and my patrons at patreon.com slash unnatural vegan. I do post two exclusive videos a month for tier two members and patrons. One is just a little vlog talking about myself and the kids, whatever's going on with us. And then the other one is a controversial topic. I do just like whatever I want to talk about. Last month was self-driving cars. I've done one on Blippi. You never know. You never know what you're going to get. I think this was the first Eric Berg video I've ever seen, and it is just fucking horrible. Heated linolenic acid in the seed oils that are oxidized or damaged to the point where it can create a lot of free radical damage and like a rusting out effect on your cells. I was just going to respond to his, you know, thinking, okay, he's one of the big proponents. He's, you know, has more credibility, but it's just mostly him talking about, again, the liver and symptoms and then seed oils because inflammation, like he doesn't give like any information. <laughs> Have I shown my microphone stand yet? This puzzles. I actually, oh no, oh, it turned off. My microphone turned off. I actually got a puzzle board put my puzzle on <gasps> which is great but now I just have the puzzle that's been sitting there for like months and I haven't touched it I keep wanting to but then it's like video games movies it's you know it's hard oh and that's right I'm triggered because the last time I did I hurt my back so the number of times I have hurt my back doing a jigsaw puzzle <laughs> it's just the saddest fucking thing the first time I hurt my back was doing a puzzle was reaching over the table to get a piece they hurt me so much all the time, but I keep coming back. Oh, sound like a Lana Del Rey song. <laughs> I'm not even gonna use that for the thumbnail. There's no fucking way I'm gonna have my mouth. <laughs> oh my god, did I get oil? Did I actually drip? <laughs>